Okay, if you've been following along in this lecture series so far, we've been covering quite a lot of ground in a relatively short period of time, so this is probably a good opportunity to take a quick recap of everything that we've covered. So um, we started with a very brief history of science. That was sort of the, the first setup that I tried to sort of walk through to try to establish some, some context. Uh, but we really got rolling when we got to the early 20th century philosophy of science, starting in particular with the logical positivists. Now, hopefully you recall that the positivists were trying to find a kind of logic of confirmation that they would combine with a strictly defined understanding of what empirical observations were. Uh, and that would allow uh, the grounding of any sort of proper legitimate scientific theory. So that's empirical observation, logic of confirmation equals uh, a grounding of a scientific theory. Um, after that, I did a short tour of both the old problem of induction and the new problem of induction. The old problem dates back to David Hume, and it says that the future is under no obligation to mimic the past. There's no way to ever know that the rules that applied yesterday will necessarily apply tomorrow, and therefore we can never really know anything at all about the, the future or about unobserved cases. Uh, Nelson Goodman was responsible for the so-called new riddle of induction, uh, who actually looks at uh, the problem in a sort of the opposite direction. He actually says that uh, the, the mimic, the, the, there's all sorts of ways in which the future will mimic the past. And the, the future is actually guaranteed to mimic the past in some way. The problem is, is that we don't know which way it is. Uh, it, it could mimic it in any number of ways, uh, and many of those ways are mutually incompatible with one another. Uh, and so this sort of led us to the conclusion that which, whether you're looking at Hume or you're looking at Goodman, science can't possibly rest on induction. So where we picked up from that point then was Karl Popper suggested that that's okay because science does not rest on induction. Science actually rests on deduction. Science done properly is deductive, Popper said. It starts by this, uh, uh, the process of conjecture saying, hey, maybe the universe works this way, and then we go out and try to refute that idea. And refutation, according to Popper, is a deductive process. Uh, all you need to uh, refute a universal law is one counterexample. And so that's what distinguishes science for, from Popper's point of view. It's, it's false falsifiability. That's how he uh, uh, defined the criteria uh, of demarcation. That's what demarcates science from pseudoscience. After that, we looked at Thomas Kuhn, who pointed out that uh, the philosophers of science, uh, by and large, have been ignoring the role of the history of science, and that when you actually look at the history of science, it's nothing at all like what philosophers would have you believe. Karl Popper, for example, um, uh, says that scientists should work in a way that basically no scientists ever actually have. Um, so when Kuhn looks at the history, what he sees is that science actually works by a series of scientific paradigms, uh, and, and that paradigm governs scientific practice within that particular field until that paradigm starts to slowly encounter anomalies, and either those anomalies are dealt with and resolved, or they start to accumulate, and ultimately the paradigm undergoes a scientific revolution. Old paradigm is thrown out, new paradigm is ushered in. Now, a paradigm deeply influences the way we view a wor the world, or at least the world as shown to us by a particular sort of scientific field. And it's really uh, very, very hard to talk in some sort of clear, straightforward sense about the facts or the data than we might have naively thought. Paradigms influence the, uh, uh, these things so much that, that the, the facts or the data are, are less sort of decisive when it comes to understanding uh, the, the nature of, of reality and our place in it. After Kuhn, uh, we saw the post-Kuhnian philosophers, starting with Emir Lakatos, who tried to sort of fuse Kuhn's historical insights, but try, also tried to find room for sort of objective scientific progress. And so he proposed the idea that he called a research program, a scientific research program, which is sort of is, is supposed to sort of take power away from the judgment of the scientific community, which is what Kuhn was trusting. Lakatos didn't really trust the scientific community, and instead sort of tried to sort of measure progress in terms of sort of puzzle-solving power, in terms of ex expanding the power of the research program uh, to make it more progressive and to avoid degeneration. And then after that, we looked at Paul Feyerabend's epistemological anarchism that tried to reject any kind of rules or any kind of method in science because he said that those any such rules would stifle scientific creativity, and science is at its best when it's being incredibly creative uh, and insightful and coming up with new ways of thinking about about and seeing the world. From there, we transitioned into the sociology of science, and the sociology of science was, viewed itself as a successor discipline to the philosophy of science, and it, it tried to sort of get behind uh, the philosophy of science and sort of show the, the real underlying principles that govern how science works. Uh, it, we looked at the Strong Program, which tried to sort of take these sort of radical Kuhnian ideas one step further and claim that uh, science isn't only conditioned by social interests and by personal interests and these sort of non-scientific values. They actually said that science was driven fundamentally 
fundamentally by non-scientific values, in particular social interests or political interests, rather than something like evidence. Uh, and then we looked at feminist critiques of science, which pointed out the ways in which fe uh, women have been marginalized by science. They've been sort of ignored and excluded. Their perspectives have uh, been uh, not taken seriously. And the basic conceptual groundwork that was used to understand uh, things like truth and evidence and data uh, were, were tainted with a very particular male-centric bias. Uh, we also looked at feminist epistemology, which charged that ideas like knowledge and reason itself actually have a fundamental male bias, at least as, as they tend to be exercised in fields uh, like, uh, like most scientific disciplines. And we did a sort of a brief tour of science studies, in particular the idea of postmodernism, which uh, charged that science basically is just another form of literary criticism. And you know, most literary criticism looks at literature and tries to sort of read it in a variety of different ways. And really, all science is doing is trying to read nature in a variety of different ways. And there really is no no sort of objective truth or one particular way of looking at any literary text and likewise there's no one particular way authoritative way of looking at nature um, so they ended up being very very skeptical and sort of rejecting ideas of evidence or truth or reality in the way that scientists think of them they, they sort of thought these ideas were kind of naive Okay, that's a brief recap. Now the question comes, where should we go from here? After all these sort of different ideas that we've sketched out, it seems like it's time to sort of shift gears, shift directions a little bit, uh, and to try to sort of uh, take a, a step further back to, to understand uh, a variety of issues which have cut not so much temporally in, in, in the direction of time, which we've been going in. I started at the beginning of the 20th century. We've moved up basically to the end of the 20th century. Um, I want to sort of go back now and try to sort of look at some of the same sorts of questions that we've already been covering but from a slightly different point of view so I mean, with, with relatively few exceptions like with La with the exception of the possibly Lakatos perhaps pretty much everyone since Thomas Kuhn has been pulling us in the direction of relativism uh, or there's been more milder and more extreme forms of relativism but uh, it's uh, it has sort of uh, suggested that you know there's, there, it's, it's no mistake that we sort of ended up by talking about you know the strong program of sociology of science and then and then postmodernism uh, which which really are sort of very very radical extreme extensions of underlining Kuhnian principles about about relativism. Now, if, if you're not comfortable with relativism, this is something to be concerned about. It looks kind of like we might be stuck in a hard uh, between a rock and a hard place. Either we have to sort of deny the sort of impetus of Thomas Kuhn, or we have to somehow accept relativism. And neither of those two views seem terribly per terribly appealing, at least to a lot of people. Uh, so if you're if you're like those people, then then it seems like we're going to be in trouble because uh, it, it's really hard to deny the kinds of insights that Kuhn had, at least modern moderate Kuhn really had uh, a, a pretty solid argument in favor of the, of the importance of the historical perspective. And that historical perspective kind of seems like it's what pushes us towards relativism. So maybe there's a way we can sort of try to find what is appealing about uh, uh, sort of the moderate Kuhn, Kuhnian approach, while sort of avoiding the radical Kuhnian approach, um, uh, we're gonna we can't turn our backs on Kuhn entirely. His his ideas are too powerful and too influential and too important to just ignore. Um, but uh, again, it, it's tricky to avoid the inertia that comes along with sort of studying Kuhn and and, and which ends up sort of pulling you in in that radical direction. So I think what, what we're looking for here is some way of synthesizing a whole host of concepts um, in, in a, 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 and to come at a lot of these ideas in a different way than the, 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 the general trajectory of the course that we've been following, at least since Thomas Kuhn. So there's a short list of things that we've been dealing with. We've been talking about empiricism and the role of evidence, observation, and experimentation. Uh, we've been looking for, we looked at the logical positivist idea of the logic of confirmation. We looked at Popper's idea of the falsification. Uh, we looked at Willard Van Orman's Quine notion about holism and about testing and the, and the web of belief. We looked at Kuhn's ideas about paradigms, and we looked in particular at a lot at the sort of how the various social structures of science govern scientific practice, scientific belief, uh, and scientific testing. Maybe there's a way to bring all of these together in a way that you know isn't necessarily an absolutely cohesive whole, but might be able to sort of cut to some of the powerful insights that these different ideas have and tie them together in a way that isn't sort of Kuhnian, isn't sort of relativistic in this way. Um, now, again, this is going to be sort of sloppy work, of course, because there's no sort of obvious thread that ties all of these things together. Any attempt to tie them together is going to have to sort of deliberately uh, cut out certain parts of these ideas that don't necessarily fit well with others. Um, and it's going to end up being something kind of like a Frankenstein's monster in a lot of ways. But maybe that Frankenstein's monster might actually be pretty useful and pretty, uh, pretty powerful, even if it is going to have its own flaws.
Now, what I want to say is that, is that this sort of Frankenstein's monstrous is precisely what you get when you start turning towards naturalism and scientific realism, two really important ideas in the philosophy of science, which I've heretofore basically been ignoring. Um, so I want to unpack these ideas, um, in particular in the rest of this lecture, but in a lot of ways, these two ideas will be sort of central to the rest of, of the conversations that I plan on having in this series. So let's start with naturalism, or, or if you prefer, naturalistic philosophy. Uh, and I think maybe the best way to understand what naturalism is doing is to contrast it with the kind of thing that the logical positivists were doing. The positivists were looking for a logical foundation of science. They wanted to ground science in logic. They wanted to say, you know, because logic is so st stable, logic is so reliable, it's so powerful, if we could ground science in logic, then logic will be able to inherit that stability and that kind of certainty. Uh, and that's what they really wanted. They thought the job of the philosophy of science was to ground science in logic. But maybe the philosophy of science isn't really about grounding science at all. Maybe that's just sort of a mistaken project. Maybe the project shouldn't be about how to find a foundation for science. Maybe instead it should be about trying to sort of understand how science relates to everything in a broader sense. Maybe the job of philosophy of science should be to sort of basically just sort of to be a, an extension or a continuation of science. So the name naturalism is a name that's given to a variety of different and interrelated ideas. This is an ambiguous term. It can mean different things. Uh, but in, the, in, in this context, in the context of the philosophy of science, or at least in the context that I'm using it in this series, naturalism is the idea that, quote, philosophy should be continuous with science. That is to say, basically, that there really is only sort of one domain of inquiry, and that domain of inquiry is the natural world. So whether or not you're doing science or whether or not you're doing philosophy, you're fundamentally still talking talking about the same subject matter. Um, what you're sim The differences between philosophy and science isn't the kind of subject matter, the kind of questions that they're asking. It's rather simply a question rather about sort of what particular methods, what particular tools you're using to address that. But that difference is much more techno uh, technological rather than it is conceptual. And I think it's not too hard to sort of uh, draw from this if you take a look in particular at the history of, of, of how uh, academic disciplines are carved up. I've mentioned before, of course, that science is a, in many ways a descendant of philosophy. Science used to be called natural philosophy, uh, and it is only really in the 19th century that starts to sort of be carved off and treated as an autonomous set of disciplines from philosophy. But in a lot of ways, that kind of carving off is an academic fiction. It's something that's done to make organizing universities and, and professional journals and things like that easier rather than because the underlying subject matter is sort of fundamentally different. Philosophy really does sort of trespass and interrelate with a whole bunch of different other fields. Philosophy, you know, there, there, there's elements of philosophy in psychology and in the, the natural sciences. I mentioned before how the, the, the job of sociology and the job of philosophy is, are, are very, very similar. A lot of the questions are similar. A lot of the tools are similar. Um, and then even sort of within you know, a, a field like science, it's really hard to know exactly where to draw the line between, for example, physical chemistry and chemistry or, or biochemistry and biology or organic chemistry in biology, uh, you know, geology uh, versus uh, astronomy versus physics in the more general sense, anthropology versus primatology. Uh, these disciplines overlap and interrelate in a lot of different ways, and it's basic, it's, it's kind of just false to suggest that these are fundamentally different fields. And so if we're sort of comfortable with that, if we recognize that you know, the, the way we carve up these disciplines isn't because of some sort of deep truth about the nature of the subject matter, but instead simply uh, a convenience for organizing things, then, then it, it makes sense to go back and sort of transgress these boundaries and just sort of break them down uh, and sort of deliberately engage in interdisciplinary work. And, and when we do that, we can find sort of new solutions to old problems. That is to say that philosophy can use science to solve problems within philosophy, including problems in the philosophy of science. Now, that probably leads to an obvious objection right there. Doesn't that sort of suggest that naturalism is circular, even viciously circular? And then, of course, it's also an interrelates to another concern that naturalism might ultimately end up leading to eliminating philosophy as a whole. In particular, the field of epistemology, uh, there is a concern that epistemology might basically just be reduced to cognitive science. And 
that's something that makes a lot of people, in particular a lot of philosophers, kind of nervous because, hey, aren't we going to be out of a job? So I want to address both of these problems in turn, starting with the first problem. How is it possible to use science to solve problems in the philosophy of science without basically sort of begging a whole host of questions, right? Don't we need to get clear on the, on, on sort of the, on the conceptual foundations of science before we can sort of use scientific tools to understand any sort of de uh, broader problems? I mean, doesn't philosophy have to have priority here? Solve the philosophical quandaries first and then move on to the scientific quandaries. But if that's the case, then we can't possibly use the scientific information to solve problems in philosophy. That's putting the cart before the horse. Um, uh, that is to say, and again, this is the uh, sort of a kind of approach that, that the logical posits were going for. We want to ground science first. We want to make sure that it's, it, it, it's, it's established, that it's stable, that it has something like a logical foundation first before we can sort of go off and start using it. Uh, you know, I mean, after all, if we tried to judge astrology by the standards of astrology, then astrology will probably come out looking pretty well, too. If we're using the tools of science to assess science itself, then we're gonna, aren't we going to be begging the question? Don't we need some kind of external, an independent? Independent justification for science, an independent way of making sense of science before we uh, sort of turn around and try and start solving the deeper problems there too. So it, it makes sense, I think, to sort of contrast naturalism here with an alternate position, which we, we can call foundationalism. Uh, the intuition that science has to be understood from the outside looking in uh, is, is a way of understanding foundationalism. The idea that, that philosophy has to provide some sort of foundation for science, hence foundationalism. Now, the basic naturalist position says that, well, we're probably just basically never going to be able to do that. I mean, you can look at it historically, right? I mean, the the, the their philosophers have been trying to provide a, a foundation for science since, you know, our, uh, uh, far back as maybe Rene Descartes, if not necessarily even Plato or Aristotle. And in some sense or another, all, all these attempts to provide a foundation have proven pretty seriously flawed. I don't think it's uh, it being too uh, controversial to say that the attempts to provide a foundation for science, philosophers trying to attempt to provide a foundation for science, have failed at least to one degree or another. So that sort of suggests that maybe that task is the wrong task. Maybe rather than trying to justify science, naturalism sort of just can just refuse the, the, the charge that science needs a justification. I mean, if you really take the sort of the, the, the skeptical argument seriously, the, the science skeptic who says, yeah, how can we know we really trust science? This is going to people like Descartes can be associated with an argument like this. Well, you know, if, if you don't accept science, uh, then... How? What kind of argument can a person give to sort of suggest that science ought to be trusted and expected? I mean, maybe if you're completely ignorant of science, if you have no understanding of what science is or how it works at all, then maybe you can sort of see being skeptical. But if you have at least a rough understanding of what science is and how it works, at least a functional understanding, um, then it seems like either you're going to be sold and say, yes, yeah, science works, even if we don't fully understand exactly how it works, we know that it works, or, or alternatively, you're just going to sort of be wedded to your, your, your deep, skepticism. Um, and, the, the, you know, again, the philosophers like Rene Descartes try to give an answer to that kind of deep skepticism, but the naturalist is just going to say, look, th this is a waste of time. You can't prove in any deep sense of the word prove that science is our best epistemic tool. But you know what? We can't really prove that we're not a brain in a vat or that we're not into the matrix or that we're not dreaming right now. These are sort of standard Cartesian skeptic skeptical arguments. Maybe we don't really need to answer those questions. We don't need to prove we're not plugged into the matrix. These are the kinds of questions which can be fun and entertaining to think about, you know, in sort of a late night bull session just to, to amuse yourself. But when we're trying to do serious work, serious intellectual work, these seem like questions that should just be set aside. Some questions can be safely ignored. They don't need to be answered and they don't need to plague us into uh, staying up late at night wondering if science is actually justified.